Hello and welcome everybody. We're here at Cass Arts in Islington and we're speaking to Andy Farr about his new exhibition, The Twisted Rose, which um, covers PTSD and shares people's uh, personal experiences with the illness. And I'm Lisa Woods. I work with Breakforth, uh, which is a mental health agency based predominantly in Norfolk and Suffolk at the moment. However, we aim to expand around the country. Um, we basically work with people in the community, helping to support them with mental health problems, um, to reach their potential, which has otherwise been barriered by certain, well, by il their illnesses that they have. I guess, as well as that, we aim to spread awareness of mental health problems through our social media and hearing different people's stories. Um, and I, yeah, I guess the mantra that we work by is that mental health is not a part of your identity. And I feel like we need to get that point across a lot more in today's world. Um, so yeah, as I said, this exhibition is about PTSD. And I just thought I'd say like a few things about PTSD. So PTSD is an illness which people often connect it to war veterans, you know, as the term, in the term shell shock. But it's important that we understand that there's so many different triggers for PTSD. And one in three people that go through a traumatic experience actually develop PTSD. And yeah, I guess we'll get into the questions. So yeah, basically, can you tell, tell us how you became an artist? <laughs> um, that is a slightly long and circuitous story. Um, as a lot of people are, I was quite into art at school. And then for various reasons, just talked out of then doing any art at A level and beyond. And so my life went down another path into marketing and advertising and things like that. Um, but my sons are both very artistic and they started getting me back into art when they were sort of 10, 12, that sort of age. Um, and I started doing more, you know, I got the paints back out again and started painting again. Um, and then in 2009, I was very seriously ill and when I was lying in a hospital bed, I thought, if I survive this, uh, I've had enough of commuting down to London and I'm going to take a slightly different direction, um, which is what I did when I got out of hospital, I went back to work, and after six months, I handled my notice and said, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something different. And I then spent that summer, I worked with a, an artist called Caroline Hulse, who ran art courses and she obviously saw something in what I did and I started doing lots of different types of art and abstract and landscapes and all sorts of things. Um, and I started to do more and then uh, we got to 2014 and the centenary of World War One was coming up and my sons would both have been you know, ripe for sending off to Belgium to be blown up and shot at and hit with shrapnel and whatever, and yet they knew nothing about World War I. And that gave me the idea to try and do some art which was a bit more political, with a, you know, with a purpose to it. And I, I managed to get some funding from the Arts Council to do a project working with schools around, predominantly the Midlands and the North, um, creating artwork that made them think about the significance of World War One, what war was about, what actually happened 100 years ago and why that was still relevant to them as teenagers today. Um, so that, and, I, and as soon as I got, I mean, in a way, I hadn't got the Arts Council on me, I suddenly thought, oh, I'm an artist. And there's a slightly wrong way around, but yeah, that almost gave me the sort of stamp of approval. I thought, oh, oh, actually, they think I'm an artist, so <laughs> maybe I am. Yeah. So in saying that, what would you say that the role of an artist is in society? Like, what made you want to pursue it as a career? Um, that is a... Because I think I didn't... When I started doing art, that re I wasn't really thinking of it as a career. I was just doing it because I enjoyed painting and I enjoyed capturing images and expressing things. But I think increasingly I've come to realise that, you know, whilst I'm not political with a big P... I am political with a small p. I'm interested in society and what's going on in society. And for me, art, in its broadest sense, is a way of, of me communicating what I think about issues and also getting other people to think about issues in maybe a slightly different way. Um, 
I mean, something like post-traumatic stress isn't something that someone would necessarily say, oh, I want to come and see an exhibition about, but I think if you do it in the right way, people can almost be subtly interested in something without it being sort of like a heavy-handed sort of, yeah, you must, you must be interested in this, but you can sort of um, gently raise their awareness, maybe them think about something in a slightly different way. Mm. So I guess, I guess the role of an artist or a filmmaker or a poet is, is to get people to think and yeah. maybe challenge their assumptions. Yeah. And are there any particular artists that have like notably inspired you across your artistic journey? Um, that's an, I mean, I've been... I guess I've been inspired more by style than I have necessarily their political agenda. So, I mean, when I first started out, I was, you know, I, I liked quite an eclectic group of artists, you know, from Monet through to Rothko to um, even back to someone like Caravaggio, who, you know, a horrible, horrible individual, but I like the actual portrayal of, of people. Um, but while I was doing the MA, which I started doing uh, during the World War I project, uh, the tutors there introduced me to some of the Eastern European artists. So there's one artist in particular called Daniel Pittin, who I really like, and he's a filmmaker as well as an artist and so the, 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 his paintings tend to have lots of layers and a sense of time to them which I also try and capture to some degree in, in what I'm doing. Yeah and so other than exploring the topic of PTSD what other topics have you explored through your art? Um, well as we mentioned the World War One project took me in number of different directions but one of them was to start to think around the legacy of that war and there's some very powerful art around shell shock and you know some of it by, by German artists like Otto Dix and there's another one who, whose name I can remember Franz Meyer I think it is but some name like that um, which is very powerful um, focusing on the the after effects of being exposed to war. And that interest in, in that kind of art was one of the factors that led towards me doing this project. Um, the other was um, during the MA, I'd always known that I would want to revisit my own childhood. My father was um, developed bipolar when I was about 12, 13. And that had quite a profound effect on the family you know, in terms of his behaviour suddenly became very erratic and he did a number of things which required quite a lot of uh, um, picking up the pieces afterwards. And then he was sectioned and so you know, as, a, as a 12, 13 year old I was visiting him in, in, a, uh, in a mental hospital and that was obviously had quite a profound effect on me. And I, it wasn't really until he died about five years ago that I really started to think about what effect that had had on me and also gave me an interest in trying to understand um, other people who've suffered from bipolar and depression. So a lot of the work I did in my MA final show was around my explorations of my own childhood but also based on talking to other people who'd had uh, experience of, of bipolar and, and how they felt. And the final show was very interesting because a lot of people came up to me and started talking to me about their own experience of mental health. So it was almost like the, the artwork was a, um, a catalyst or, or, an, or gave them freedom to, to talk about their own experiences. Um, I'm guessing what the original question is. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. You can uh, cover as much um, topics as you want. But yes, so that combination of the mental health... Yeah interest and the shell shock. Yeah. Um, I haven't really put those two pieces of the jigsaw yeah. together, um, but I approached the Institute of Mental Health, which mm. is a, um, it's based in Nottingham and it's a joint thing between the University of Nottingham and the NHS Trust in Nottingham. Uh, and I approached them to exhibit the work I've done for the MA. And they said, I'd love to exhibit the work, but actually we'd be more interested in you doing a new piece of Work, working with us that kind of picks up on the shell shock area and is based around PTSD. So that's really the genesis for this exhibition was 
Whereas them joining the dots rather than me necessarily joining the dots. Yeah. And could you tell us a little bit about the exhibition? Maybe like talk about some of the stories, or just give a be- brief overview. Yeah, of yeah. The I mean, it's, it's, um, so what happened after I first started talking to them was one of the things I realised from my own work was, or one of the things I certainly in thinking about it, one of the reasons I felt it had actually been successful was because it was based on my own lived experience of, of living you know, with, a, with a father who developed bipolar. Um, so I felt it was quite important that if I did this project with the IMH that I needed, the, I needed to talk to people who'd actually got experience of PTSD and really understand their individual emotions and feelings and experiences. And so they were able to uh, connect me with um, one lady in particular, who's, who's Marissa Lambert, who's painting that shoes. This is, based, this is based on Marissa's story. But she, whilst she'd also, um, she developed post-traumatic trauma based on her child who was diagnosed while she was in the womb as having a serious heart defect. And so all the way through the pregnancy, she was obviously worried about whether the child would survive, and then as soon as she was born, she was whisked off and put on machines and wired up and whatever. Um, and so Marissa's trauma a lot, it relates to that. Um, but Gretel, her daughter, is now very, is very is fine. Uh, and that's Gretel dressed in a dragon costume from an advert from the British Heart Foundation, who she worked with. Um, but Marissa was then able to connect to me with other people through, she runs uh, peer support network. So she goes into places like the police or a hospital and helps them to set up a, a peer support network within their own organisation. So quite a few of the people here, uh, so Adam, the paramedic, Emil, who is on that back wall over there, um, and a few of the others, um, were people she'd actually dealt with. Um, and the way it very much worked was because Basically, what we said to people is, if you're interested in taking part in this project, let us know. It was very much sort of, it wasn't push, it was sort of like, well, we put out the information that this is happening, and then people came to me or came to Marissa and said, yeah, we're interested. And then it might, in the case of Adam, it actually took five months for him to, through various emails and thinking about it, to actually say, yeah, actually, I do want to tell my story. Um, And he was quite resistant initially, but... Then when I went to see him, he basically said, yeah, no, I think it's important that if I don't speak out about what's happened to me um, and tell people about how it feels to be a a paramedic and why um, it can impact on your life so dramatically, then other people won't benefit from that. And one of the things I didn't know was that there's a very high suicide rate amongst paramedics. And it's partly to do with the fact that you go into a situation you're expected to be this sort of heroic figure, deal with the situation, but you never really have a chance to process what's happening, the decisions you're making in that blur of activity. And then, obviously, afterwards, um, you can then live with some of, have to live with the decisions and things which you did, which were probably the right decisions, but afterwards, you always wonder if they are. Um, so, each, so I say each of the paintings is basically based on me working directly with one person who suffered from different types of, of trauma. So some of it is abuse, some of it is two, two paintings based on people who were in the military. Um, there's a few people whose trauma relates to birth, either um, things that happened to them during the birth um, or happened to their children. Um, and I'm now working with some more people, one of whom is a policeman, um, so it, it's, it's interesting, and, and one of the things that's interesting about, which I didn't realise about post-traumatic stress, is I mean, the, the, whilst the cause may well be very different, the symptoms are often very similar. So the flashbacks, anxiety, um, sleeplessness, anxiety, hypervigilance, irrespective of whether it's come from maybe historical child abuse or uh, being exposed to horrific things in, when you're in the army or whatever. The, the physical effects are often very similar. Um, 
So what I've tried to do very much with the paintings is to capture that emotional response to what happened, rather than necessarily dwell on the details of the, the trauma itself, but to focus on how people felt, but then also what effects recovering from trauma has had. And this was something which I really didn't understand, I think, going into the project, that actually, whilst obviously you never forget what's happened to you, you can actually recover from it. And there was actually a quote um, from one of the books which I read, which I'm, I'm just going to read out, um, because I think it applies to quite a few of the, the people I've worked with. And this is from a book by an American woman called Bella Ruth Napastek, um, who doesn't seem to be that well known over here, but it's actually quite big in, in, in the US. But she says, in spite of the terror and sorrow, and the guilt and the shame and the numbness and the rage, survivors can emerge from their PTSD experience with a greater ability to feel deeply, experience joy, savor the preciousness of life, and appreciate beauty in a way they never did before. Able to empathize with a deep, with a depth of compassion that wasn't accessible to them previously. And that, I think, is quite interesting. And certainly, so the painting at the end, uh, which is a painting of Danny McNamara, who some people may have heard of. He's actually in a band called Embrace that is just coming up to its 20th year anniversary. And he basically uh, said that it, having recovered from his trauma, he became more creative and it sort of unlocked a whole theme of musical expression that he didn't feel he had before. So whilst you'd never want to, someone to go through traumatic situations, the process of recovery can actually be um, genuinely life-changing, um, which I think makes it quite an interesting area to work in because you know that if you can help people, there is an opportunity for genuine growth and recovery and for people to move on in their lives and maybe move on in a, in a different direction from the one they were in already. Yeah, and when you were creating this art, did you yourself feel like personally like a lot of pressure to depict their experiences in like a dignified and an accurate way? Um, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, I think the thing, normally as an artist, you're creating work in a, in a bubble and you're creating it for yourself and then you expose it to an audience and you hope that some people will like it. Um, but to be honest, you're almost creating it out of your own head and, you, and you, you judge it on your own merits. This was quite different in that I felt very much there was, there was another person involved and I needed to interpret their story in a way that was both respectful to them, but wasn't also, but also added something to what their experience had been. So it wasn't just a case of painting exactly what had happened to them. Um, and so, you know, the first painting I actually showed to somebody was, was um, with a girl called Rachel who had suffered um, birth trauma. And I remember you know, the sense of trepidation when I sent her an email with the JPEG attached and said, this is, this is where we've got to. And she was the first person who came back to me. And actually, I will read out another quote if I can find it. Because Rachel was, Rachel's response was actually very helpful. So they actually encouraged me to carry on. It sort of made me think, oh, actually, I'm, I am actually doing something potentially quite powerful here. So she wrote back to me and said, I'm actually speechless. I cried. The colours are perfect. The me looking round the corner completely sums up that feeling of being lost in a grey world, feeling frightened of everything. Welcoming Rachel is the old one, old me too. It's like you looked into my head and painted. It's honestly amazing. Well, I clearly hadn't looked into her head, but somehow I tapped into something <laughs> that she was feeling. Yeah. Um, I went to bed thinking about the painting, and it's almost like now there is a third Rachel. The one I am now, who's able to connect with both the figures in the painting, which is really nice. Today also happened to be my last counselling session ever, so it's all come together really nicely. And so, you know, we're getting that response back. I mean, you think, well, actually, in a way, 
the individual audience is probably the most important audience for this, which wasn't how I'd <coughs> gone into this. I was thinking initially that this would be... I was working with people, but actually the audience I was trying to reach was, was the general public in terms of trying to give them a greater understanding of, of post-traumatic stress. But actually, I think the most important audience has been the individual people I've worked with. Um, and I mean, Adam, I mentioned Adam earlier on, well, it really does feel like the painting gave him some confidence to actually go out of himself. And he, you know, that painting he had published in a paramedic's newsletter, and there was an article about him, and oh, he said, uh, if I can find the Adam quote, um, this is what he wrote for the paramedic's newsletter, and it says, I believe a byproduct of being in emergency services expo is exposure to trauma, which in turn may lead to mental health. I've had too many friends, crewmates, and colleagues, both on the service and in my home life, take their own lives for reasons often unknown. People who you wouldn't think had mental health problems, who appeared outwardly confident, but mentally must have struggled with no support. I don't want to see that happen to anyone else. And I'm hoping by myself speaking out will encourage others to do so also. And I think, you know, I'm not sure Adam was in a place to say that, start of the project, but um, obviously he was still having counselling and talking to people, but I think the painting played a role in expressing his inner feelings. Um, so yeah, each of the paintings, and, and anybody who wants to know more about that, you have to go on, the, on my website, um, then there's a story behind each of the paintings um, that's quite, quite powerful. Um, it was interesting, when I first started talking to Marissa, and we talked about how we would approach um, the various people she knew through her peer support networks, one of the things she raised with me, which I'd never thought about, was actually, was she said, well, who's actually going to support you as the artist? So you're dealing with people who are having, you know, have some pretty um, difficult experiences. Um, and I hadn't really thought through that. I mean, I just assumed that... Um, I would be able to sort of ride above. And, and largely, I think, because I've not really been dwelling on the, the specifics of, of what's happened to them, that's, that's not been too much of a problem, except for one, which was, uh, was a painting based on a, a lady called Sandra, who her experience is probably the most... I, I can't imagine anything any worse than what she went through. Um, her first family were murdered by her first husband about 20 years ago. Um, and then she had another family, not very long afterwards. And she tried not to say anything about what had happened to her. She tried to bury that experience from the first family and tried to... Because she didn't want to upset other mothers. She didn't want her children to feel that they were being brought up in any kind of... Um, so she, she buried a very, very traumatic experience quite, quite deep inside, put it in a box and hid it in there. Um, and then a combination of events happened about 10 years later. Her father died and she suffered a debilitating back injury. And that seemed to unlock all of those memories and she just became overwhelmed by the flashbacks and the anxiety and started self-harming and drinking too much and just generally couldn't function properly. And she went, had quite a lot of therapy and, and finally met a wonderful man called Stephen Regal, who is a truly, I don't know, there's some people you meet and there's just an aura of calm about them. He's just, and gentleness, he's just a truly lovely man. Um, and working with him, she reached the point where she wanted to acknowledge that she'd actually had two families. Because one of the things she said was that in her house she didn't have any pictures of the second family because she didn't have any pictures of the first family and she couldn't, somehow in, out of guilt for the first family, she didn't have pictures of the second family, but she now wanted to actually say, um, acknowledge to the world and to the people she knew that actually she had had two families and, and sort of almost celebrate the life of the first two children. So 
out of that um, conversation, which initially happened through uh, Stephen Regal, her therapist, um, I created a painting, which is essentially two family photograph albums, one which features the first family and one which features a second family who are now grown up and um, very happy and, and successful children. Um, but just painting that first family was extremely... I mean, I was, as a, as a parent myself, or, I mean, I, I don't know whether that affects... I think, I think it probably does affect you more if you're a parent, but somehow you, you're looking at two children and thinking, you know, what happened to them. So that was, of, of the 16 people I've worked with, that was the, the one that really uh, was very hard. For me, and, and yeah, you know, and back to Marissa's point, yeah, you know, actually, I did need to talk to people about that and, and try and understand what was happening and, and, and not bottle it up. Which I think, it actually, just slightly tangentially, I think one of the things that is very important with uh, PTSD is talking. I mean, whether that's talking to your family, talking to friends, talking to a therapist, whatever, talking appears to be from everything I've done, you know, is, is the most important thing. As soon as you bottle things up, it becomes a problem and you bury it. Eventually, it will bubble to the surface. Um, and talking and art and poetry and any form of self-expression is a way to try and get over that, that um, get some of those feelings out of your system and try and move on. Um, and I think what's interesting is the work that Marissa does through peer support seems to be as powerful, if not more powerful, than, than actual therapy. So if you can talk to people who you feel understand and have some knowledge of what you might have been through, that seems to be the most powerful form of conversation. So hence, paramedics talking to paramedics, police people talking to police people, soldiers talking to soldiers, um, mothers talking to other mothers, seems to be one of the most powerful ways of, un of unlocking things and moving on with your life. You mean, I mean, as I think I said before, you don't forget what's happened to you, but you can reconcile yourself to it and acknowledge that it's happened and then um, move on and live, live your life again. Yeah. And do you feel like, as a society, we talk about mental health problems enough? Um, I think, I mean, the answer is no. But I think it's better than it was. Um, and if I think about my father, who had a very difficult upbringing and then his job proved to be quite frustrating. Um, and obviously, something like bipolar, there is a chemical component to it, but I'm sure, and I'm not a psychologist, or, but I'm sure there's actually a, a nurture environment factor that leads to some of the triggers. But the point I was going to make was that the first response back in, so this would have been back in the 1970s, was to pumping full of, uh, initially a drug called Largactyl, which I don't think is used anymore, and then he would put on to lithium and haloperidol and various drugs. Um, at no point was there any kind of talking therapy about any of the things which may have been contributing to his feelings. Um, and it really wasn't, yeah, and I don't, remember any support for the family or anything. So I think, think, and he was basically sectioned three or four times, disappeared off into a mental hospital for months on, on end. I, I don't think things are as bad as that these days. Mm. Um, and certainly, if you think over the last few years, you know, people like the royal family are starting to talk about mental health more, and sports people are, and people in the military, there was a very good radio interview with a, with a major, I forget what his surname was, but so I think there is more talking going on, not enough yet, and certainly not enough um, funding for things like peer support networks. Um, but I think it is, it is getting better. <laughs> if that's a, yeah. um, and I think there's lots more that can be done, and I think there's lots that can be done by... We, I think, you know, coming back to the peer support thing, I think there's a lot that can be done that isn't just done through therapists. I think therapists have a crucial role to play in psychiatrists and psychologists, but I think there's also a lot that can be done through peer networks and uh, social groups and things. I mean, ultimately, going back to my father, ultimately he did find some solace through a 
gardening scheme. He was a very keen gardener and he was also worked on the railways and there was a gardening scheme that was set up that was on an old railway siding and, and he really enjoyed that and I think had that come earlier it would have been more, more powerful but that was the thing he found um, helpful to him. So I think any of those, anything in that area, more in that area is, is, is a good thing. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, as Adam was saying, the more we can talk about how we feel, what we're going through, not bottle things up, um, and not feel any shame or guilt for having mental health issues, problems, whatever the, whatever the word is, the better. Um, and hopefully, this exhibition does a little bit of, <laughs> little bit of helps a little bit to get people to, to. Understand yeah. that anyone, uh, anyone can go through a traumatic experience, um, and I mean certainly post-traumatic stress is just a it's a physical it is actually a physical response to the fight flight response and the freezing response, which are natural bodily responses to being in danger. Um, and then what happens is the body just gets locked into a cycle and somehow you, most people, most people after a few months of something really bad happening to them generally can come to terms with what's happened to them. But some people it gets through no fault of their own. They get locked into, their brain gets locked into a kind of circular path. Um, and so things like art and poetry and whatever can help to break that yeah. cycle, I think. Yeah. And finally, going back to you, what are your plans for the future? Um, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, my immediate short-term plan is that there's this, uh, this body of work is going up to Newcastle in May. Yeah. Um, hopefully coming back to London again um, in Shoreditch in July, August, and then finishes in Lancaster for a couple of months in September through to November. So... Next week, I'm going up to um, Warrington and St. Helens to talk to some people who I'll be working with to create some more work for that exhibition in Lancaster and meeting with the curator at the gallery there to, to plan some potential events around that. So the rest of this year will be focused on, on doing more, um, more new paintings, but also trying to find other ways to get people involved in, in this project. Um, trying to understand a bit more about how and why there appear to have been some therapeutic, positive therapeutic, therapeutic outcomes to, to the project. Um, and then after that, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know at all. I mean, I, I'm obviously, I've, I've, I do have a, an interest in mental health. Uh, and if opportunities arise to work with other organisations or bodies, then I will I'll take those. Um, but yes, I'm not exactly sure. Actually, there's a potential project which, fingers crossed, we'll get some funding working with North Middlesex Hospital, who've just opened um, a mental health a &E unit, which is quite an interesting idea. So it's a, a separate to the main... Well, it's, it's a separate block within the main a &E unit, a &E unit of the hospital. Um, so I've been talking to some of the peer support workers there about creating artwork for that, for that building. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, see where the wind takes me. See where the wind <laughs> takes me, yes. I mean, it might be nice to do some painting which isn't quite so serious mm. <laughs> at some point. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's... Um, I, my son said this to me. He actually said... I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said um, it was because he's doing fine art at Glasgow and, he, and in his application to it, he basically wrote one of the questions, why do you paint? And he basically said, painting is my way of communicating. And I think probably for me, I've come to realise that this is you know, my way of communicating. So if I've got something to say, I'll probably find a project linked to art that enables me to say something about that. So, you know, the World War I project, I felt quite strongly that people of my children's age, teenagers, did not understand what happened 100 years ago and why that is still relevant today, why that was such a pointless and stupid 
war. Um, and so if other issues come up like that, I can imagine, heaven forbid, there might be something based on Brexit, which, um, yeah. <laughs> which I can I mean, it's an talk about in some way. Um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll, see. we'll see what happens. But I suspect there will be some more socially, socio-political based artwork coming along at some point. Thank you very Thank you. much.